Uh, good evening. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, hello to everyone that's watching us. Uh, tonight's going to be a very interesting lecture, uh, uh, to not say amazing. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to introduce uh, uh, Daniel Lewis. We'll be with him in a bit. Uh, my name is Millard Schisler. I'm the head of collections at the Instituto Moreira Salles, and I've been working with Avistar off and on, and it's an honor to be invited to come here and, and moderate this event. We have with us Gustavo that will be the commenter that will work with me. Uh, Gustavo, please, uh, can you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Gustavo. Hello. Uh, I, I'm an advertising, uh, advertising professional uh, working in technology and a bird watcher that uh, the pandemic gave to the world. So thank you for, for joining us and hope you have a good session. Great, thank you, Gustavo. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, Dan Lewis, as he prefers to be called. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and I'll, before you introduce yourself, I just want to say a few words uh, because I also work with archives. It's very exciting to me to see a, uh, uh, you know, I've already had the pleasure of seeing your presentation, of course, and everybody will be able to see it. The materials are very rich, and this is what we want. We want archives to become live and become things that we talk about, even, and that's uh, an incredible thing for us to use archival material to talk about things that we use today, that we think about and understand our history and understand how, you know, the things that we use today are related to uh, this time period. So I'm very happy to uh, hear what you have to say. And Dan, please introduce yourself and give us the speech we're waiting for. Okay, thank you so much, Millard. It's, it's a thrill for me to be here. I am in a hotel room in New York City right now where I am doing some work for my home institution, the Huntington Library. I'm with the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. It's one of the world's great cultural destinations. We get about a million people a year onto the grounds. They come to see the gardens. They come to see the research library and the public exhibitions. They come to do archival research and they come to use the art collections. On the grounds, people come to Bird and we're a very large and enthusiastic group of people who come to, uh, to Bird Watch and to enjoy the really spectacular botanical gardens at the Huntington. So I've been a, I'm the senior curator for the history of science and technology at the Huntington, I've been there for 26 years. I'm a little appalled I've been doing anything for 26 years, but it's been a remarkably great uh, uh, gig for me and I've enjoyed it very much. And so I'm excited to talk about uh, birds and color um, in the same sort of venue. And I wanna say that, you know, birds really are an international language. And by the same token, color is also an international language. And so, um, it's a chance to talk about these sort of combined worlds. So I want to talk about color dictionaries and I want to talk about their utility in studying birds. And so it's an intersection of these two things. So if you're a naturalist and you're in Fortaleza or Brasilia or Manaus or you're somewhere and you want to write to a naturalist in Kansas or Florida or British Columbia and you have a something that has a color, you have a shell or you have a bird or you have another natural history object, rather than saying, well, you know, I've got this thing here. And, you know, because, of course, birds don't obey geopolitical boundaries. They go wherever they want. And so um, if you're writing to someone in another country and you say, I have this feather from the species of bird and it's like a really, really, really light blue. <laughs> well, that doesn't get you very far because you need a basis of comparison. So one of the things that people have done over the centuries is try to quantify just what they mean when they mention a particular color. So I wanna talk about that for quite a bit. And I wanna talk about how they've done it, how it's worked and in some ways how it has not worked very well. So let me work my way through some of my slides in the course of doing this. Okay, so this is just a Pantone uh, shot that appeared with a Smithsonian piece I did on um, color. Um, and in some ways, the Pantone system has its origins. Even though the Pantone company wasn't founded until the 1950s, it really has its origins in these color dictionaries. And in a very significant way, it has an origin with Robert Ridgway's color dictionary that he issues in 1912. So I'll talk about quite a bit. 
So the very first thing that people did in printed form in the archival record, and of course archives are so important, I'll just make a little sideline to say, everything has a history right up until the present day, right? And so that's one of the joys of being a historian. I'm trained as a historian and it's a chance to talk about things that, are, that, that has a, have a past. Everything has a past. And I spend my days working with rare books and manuscripts from the 12th century up to the present day. So one of the first things people did were these uroscopies, these medieval texts where you um, could analyze the color of people's urine and diagnose different medical conditions that they might have had. And to do that requires actually noting the color in the book. So before um, color printing comes along, people are required to do coloring by hand. And if you're producing a book that has 100 copies or 200 copies, you have to make sure that the copies are the same and the coloring is the same from copy to copy to copy, or else the information isn't accurate. So, so if you draw a red instead of a yellow <laughs> when you're describing someone's urine, it has to be the right shade of color. And so, so there are actual practical health benefits, or, or they certainly were, <clears throat> excuse me, for the ways that people have thought about and described color over the over the centuries. Okay. So this is a really early, <clears throat> excuse me, a really early uh, predecessor of, of color. And it's a really important precursor to modern, more modern color definitions. So in 1665, the British Society, um, uh, the London Society, the Royal Society in London publishes something called the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And it's a chance for people to write articles and scientific notes and send up test um, trial balloons, as we say, um, to talk about uh, different ideas they have. And one of them um, appears in this book from 1686, where they've done the same thing with colors and they've tried to describe the colors with tiny dots. So they put a dot and a name next to the color. It's one of the very first times, if not the first time, that someone's tried to um, use color by attaching a name to a color. So this was 300, nearly 340 years ago. And then everything else is in black and white in this publication for the next 300 years or so. Um, so this is a really early important precursor to color. Um, and here's a description a little bit of the, of the slide. I'm not gonna belabor this slide, um, but let's, um, so I'm gonna move on to another. I'm just gonna show you some sample colors uh, palettes that are attempts to quantify color with a name. So I bought this for the Huntington about 12 years ago by a German uh, ar ar author and artist, um, new practical theoretical colors um, um, for, for self-instruction for all conditions is what this was, was, this was called. And so um, it's extraordinarily rare. Uh, this is the only surviving complete copy in the world. And I got it for a relatively good price for the Huntington. So um, the other thing I'll say is if you're doing research with color or with anything else for that matter, there's no substitute at all for the original materials. So I get asked a lot, have you digitized everything in your library? <laughs> the answer is no. So I, I um, was asked by our library director a few years ago to figure out how long it would take to digitize all the books in our, in our at the Huntington. And um, using five full-time camera operators working 40 hours a week. And um, I wrote him back, I said, it would take about 160 years. And by then we would have gotten more books. And manuscript material is even more complicated, but there's no substitute for seeing the originals because translating color by digitizing and printing it necessarily changes something about the color. So if you're looking at, for instance, John James Audubon's Birds of America volume, and you look at it in color, there's a beautiful sheen on the feathers because they've applied egg white or albumin to give a gloss to the colors. And there's a subtlety and distinctiveness in the original that you cannot see on any digitized version of it. So uh, colors shift, they're the shift is subtle. Sometimes it's dramatic. So this is just my plug to say, um, the, the original colors are very important and seeing them in person is very important which is one of the reasons that research libraries are very important. Okay. This is a close up of one of these, um, one of these particular um, pages and it's in German, but, and, and it's messy, but you can see that it's pretty rough. They've applied these by hand. Someone has taken a paintbrush and 
Um, so if you look at that upper leftmost one, um, that one says Konigs, Konigsgelb. It, it looks like someone got their fingerprint, <laughs> their finger pressed right onto the paper. And then you can see all the different colors here, very yellow, hell ochre is light ochre, and so on. So a very early um, application of these. Um, the problem with these colors is that if they're applied to light, they degrade. So light damage is cumulative. So the longer you leave something out or it's exposed to light, the more likely it is to fade. And so this is one of the problems inherent in any time you have color, whether it's a painting on a wall or a drawing with color or a printed work with color, it's necessarily um, at risk because of the fact that it could fade. This here, this book by Abraham Werner is one of the most famous of all color nomenclatures. Um, it's called Abraham Werner's, as it says here, nomenclature of colors. And Werner is the first person to start to think comparatively about colors and how we might make sense of the world through color. Um, Charles Darwin took this book, not this, not our copy, but he took this book on the voyage of the Beagle around the world um, in the 1830s. And so um, he was very attuned to the importance of color in studying evolution and in changes from region to region, because of course, birds and other creatures, um, you know, uh, if they're a subspecies, they might be a slightly different color. There are many different reasons that birds change colors um, as they go from region to region. Um, so if you look at this page, I'll, I'll show a close up of this. Incidentally, all the books I have to show here are out of the Huntington's own collections. Every one of these is from the Huntington's holdings. Um, and so um, you can see, um, you can see, uh, let me just show you a close up of this thing. So you can see here for red, so tile red, the animal is the breast of the cock bullfinch, um, the vegetable is a shrubby pimpernel, and the mineral is porcelain jasper. And so he's used an animal, vegetable, and mineral to describe the color, and he's printed a little swatch. So this goes on for many pages, this particular strategy. And so this is one of the very first useful ways to talk about color comparatively. So if you're, again, writing to somebody in, in another country, you're able to say, look, um, turn to page 54 and you know, turn to page, look at swatch number 54 uh, or 55. So if, say, say you, you've got this color called duck green, it doesn't reproduce very well here. It looks very dark. But say you have a color called duck green, it says neck of mallard. So the mallard duck's neck um, or the upper disc of yew leaves, a yew is a plant particular kind of tree, um, and then a, a mineral called selenite. And so, again, there are comparative, there are a bunch of points of comparison about these particular works. There are many other reasons people used color dictionaries to talk about um, different ways they tried to quantify color. Here's an example of a German um, text that used printed color in a similar way. One of the things you had to do with these is your dyes had to be very very accurate, your dye batches, so that if you're printing the color from book to book, it's very, it's very accurate. This is one of my favorite books. Um, it's called The American Dyer. Um, and it's, these are samples of yarns and wool. So if you want to buy fabric to create something made out of cloth, you open up this dye book, you select the color, and then you um, can order the color from a, from a salesperson or someone else who's selling these dyes. So Robert Ridgway um, is, a, is a person of great interest to me because he wrote two of these color dictionaries and he was the Smithsonian's curator of birds for the, his entire length of his career. And he only had a grade school education, which is really remarkable. He ended up as a naturalist on a survey of the American West in the 1860s by an explorer named Clarence King. There's a color called King's Blue named after Clarence King. And um, he was very young when he started being interested in color. He would describe uh, colors that he would write to the head of the Smithsonian and say, what is this bird? Here's a drawing of it. And here's a textual, since there are no photographs, at least he's not taking photographs uh, in the 1850s or 60s as a teenager, he writes to say, um, um, the bill is pea green, the iris of the bird is yellow, the toes are yellowish gray, the claws are dark horn, 
what is it? And so Ridgeway has to, I mean, so Spencer Bayer, the head of the Smithsonian, has to read these colors and make sense of Robert Ridgeway's descriptions of them. So in 1886, he writes this book called A Nomenclature of Colors for Naturalists and Compendium of Useful Knowledge for Ornithologists. So he means for this book to be not just for naturalists, but for bird people um, as well. So he, um, they're all hand colored. They're not printed colors, but someone's gone in with a brush for every copy and colored it by hand. And so you can see um, at the start, you can see um, just this, there's swatches of color with descriptions. They're very rough because they're painted, but they all have a very specific name. And he's very interested in the names. And he's got one called, I mean, at the beginning of the book, he says, I don't like these silly colors, elephant's breath. You know, what is that? And then he calls one of them dragon's blood red. And so he's very, um, he's more imaginative than you might think. He was a very shy, very serious guy. Um, but he really kind of came to life when he talked about colors. There are a lot of other works about color that come along. This one is something called the Practical Ostrich Dyer's um, Feather Manual. And you can see these feathers are, these extravagant feathers are colored. So if you wanted to use feathers for any sort of design purposes or other applications, you would put these feathers out of this book. It would give you instructions about how to color the feathers. Um, this book is sort of a nightmare from a conservation perspective. You can see the offset of the dyes here from the feathers. Feathers are proteinaceous, so they have proteins in them. So they're hard to manage from a conservation standpoint. This is dated to 1888, this particular book. So just a couple years after Ridgeway's first color dictionary comes out. This is one of my absolute favorite um, books. It's, uh, um, a, a, it's called, the, let me show you a better title page version of it here. It's called the Repertoire of um, Colors of, I'll just read the English what the French says, Repertoire of Colors of Flowers, Leaves, and Fruits, um, published by the French Society of Chrysanthemumists. And in it is, um, it's a very nationalist, nationalistic publication. Um, and you'll see why in a second. So he's got, um, he's got, a, he's got the color, he's got the name uh, in, in French, and then he's got the, uh, the English, the German, the Spanish, and the Italian name for the color. And, um, and so it, this comes up around the same time, 1905, a little later. Um, and it, because I'm gonna, I've got a lot of slides, I'm going to click ahead a little bit here um, to a couple of these other ones. Um, so really, I've got a lot. Of, so he's got one for Bordeaux. He calls it Bordeaux wine is the name of the color. Um, uh, the color approximating the color of Bordeaux wine. He's got a blue color and he says um, it's a blue that is the color of the sky during springtime in Paris. Like the color of the sky in Paris would be different than it would be somewhere else. But he uses that as his point of comparison. So there's a very nationalistic flavor to the ways that people describe um, a number of these uh, particular colors. There's a magenta. Um, they're really lovely. Um, and they are, um, they're just loose sheets. So you can, they're not bound into a book. So you can take them out. You can set them side by side next to something you're trying to identify. If you're trying to identify something, you want to get the color sample right next to it for accuracy, right? You don't, it's harder if you have to look through a book. So these are loose sheets here. And then in 1912, Ridgway publishes this magnum opus of his, his most important color book called Color Standards and Color Nomenclature. And he's sick of working at the Smithsonian. He's in the middle of writing um, uh, his, his eight volume book on the birds of North and Middle America. And this birds of North and Middle America is huge. It probably runs to 4,000 pages um, across the eight volumes. Um, and it's his extremely technical, detailed descriptions of all the birds of North and Middle America, many of which push down into South America because their ranges range from Central America to the very southern tip of Chile. So there's a long range of latitude about the birds he's covering. And he's describing thousands and thousands and thousands of birds in the course of writing this. So it's tedious work. So at the same time he's describing these birds, he takes up work on this color dictionary. He wants to use slides. He wants to use colors from his 1886 book, but that has only a couple hundred colors. This new book has 1,115 colors. So there are a lot of colors. 
to account for in the course of writing this particular book. And you can see he's given a, a solar spectra and then he's given a, 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 a there's a plate number, um, can't quite see it here because of this little Avastar tag, but there's a plate number, Roman numerals, and then there's a name for the, um, for the color. And on the page, it looks like this. This is what the full page um, looks like. And this is the Bulletin 50. This is the bird. This is the publication that he's, um, that he's working on tirelessly. Um, Audubon has a, Ridgeway has a difficult life. He has a, he and his wife have a son um, in the 1880s and they name him Audubon. His name is Audubon, they call him Audie. And he um, uh, really is their, their life in a lot of ways. So this is a typical, very technical description that um, Ridgeway uses to uh, describe um, different bird species. And so you can see for the short-billed pigeon, this description. What he wants to do in the course of these descriptions is he wants to apply um, a term from his dictionary. So this is venaceous drab, and you can see it here. Um, it's, uh, it's a color that he's taken right out of the dictionary and used. Same for this one here, sorghum brown. Well, even 1,115 colors is not enough. So he says, well, it's nearly uh, sorghum brown. And Ridgway has uh, many other uh, examples of, um, of, of birds with colors that he's drawn. So this is, Ridgway was an artist. In the tradition of the artist naturalist, uh, Ridgway would um, do his own artwork and would do his own, uh, his own scientific work, but he'd also do his own artwork. I don't have any pictures of this in this, presentation, but a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from a woman on the East Coast, and she said, I have a, I have a big lithographic stone with a drawing. Lith lithography is a process of printing that relies on the repulsion of oil and water. So it's what's called the non-planographic printing process, for those of you interested in printing and color printing. Lithograph, lithography. Um, she said, I have these lithographic stones, and they look like they were written by somebody named Robert Ridgway, and I see that you wrote a book on Robert Ridgway. What are these and would you like them? <laughs> and so I immediately said, well, where did they come from? And she said, well, my mother had them. And I was thinking about using them as pavers in my backyard on the ground, but they seem like they might be important. Well, of course, these are the original art. These are the original pieces of artwork for his work. And so this, it's not the image shown here, but there's a full image of a bird, several different species of birds. And so, of course, you know, if you're printing something lithographically, then it shows up in a book and it's hand colored. So I thought, hmm. And I thought maybe this appeared in Ridgway's book on the on um, the, the, the land birds of North America, as, they're, as it's called. And I went down to the to the stacks in the basement and I found the book printed in 1850 and I opened it up. Uh, and there uh, it was the exact bird shown on the lithographic stone that had been printed. So that stone contacted that piece of paper, you know, many decades ago, and then somebody hand colored it. So some of the original artwork that Ridgway done has survived. And then it was hand colored and hand coloring was the way that you was the way that you colored um, these works. Um, Woodpecker is another illustration of some of his um, some of his work. This is a, a, a grade from Ridgway's childhood. He, um, you can see how early on his interest comes along for birds. He's got a, um, he's drawn all the parts of the bird and then he's tried to describe them um, scientifically. And so you can see that he's got them described by part with this sort of fantastical color system that he's created. He's probably 12 years old, maybe 13 years old when he's doing this um, particular, um, particular bird this particular uh, drawing. Ridgway was very frustrated by the color work. And, you know, he, he was a very serious guy. He didn't have a great sense of humor, but he, uh, he wrote this, it says at the bottom, RR after a day's work at the color wheel. He was very frustrated with trying to make the colors, his 1886 book match with the 1912 colors. 
uh, and he had a very difficult time doing so. So he found it very frust to be very frustrating uh, work. This is a shot of Ridgway at his desk, and it's hard to see here, but if you look at the fingers on his right hand, the fingernails of his hand are blackened. And the reason for that is because I think, this is my theory that I propose in the book, is that he had arsenic poisoning. Um, and one of the things I discovered in reading about naturalists um, working in the springtime is that they preserved the study specimens, the skins, with arsenic because it was an insecticide, it killed bugs, it preserved the skins in very reliable condition. Um, but it's now known that, that, but a lot of these letters talked about how depressed the ornithologists were. They had no energy, they were lethargic, they didn't have any motivation. And I thought that's strange. And then I looked up the literature, the modern literature on arsenic poisoning. And it's now known to be, uh, you can get clinical depression from arsenic poisoning. And so my theory is that a lot of these people just couldn't work in the springtime um, because they were poisoned. They had arsenic poisoning. And I think Ridgway had arsenic poisoning as well. You could see it in his, you can see it in his fingers there. So Ridgway um, had a lot of, um, there are a lot of blues. <laughs> Let me go back to the slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about the blues and I wanna talk about Ampro Blue. And I'd like to, uh, I, I, this is not the time for me to pose a question to the audience that you can answer, but I, but I wonder if any of you have heard of Ampro Blue. Um, if you Google Ampro Blue, it's a Pantone color. It's a Ford car color. It's a clothing color. And you can see from this little swatch here that it was the name of one of Ridgway's colors. And if you look in Webster's Dictionary under Ampro Blue, it says um, Ampro Blue, origin 1912. Well, that's because it's the first time it's mentioned it's in 1912 in this book. The, Webster, the Webster's Dictionary uh, article says nothing about the origins of it. And so I thought, Amparo, Amparo, Amparo. So I finally figured out what Amparo, who Amparo was and what Amparo was. So, so Ridgway's son, Audubon, dies of pneumonia as a young man. In the He's 18 or 19 years old. He goes on ice skating. He catches pneumonia. He dies. They're devastated. So they moved to Costa Rica for six months um, to spend time with Jose Zeledon. Zeledon is the head of the Natural History Museum in Costa Rica. They're very close friends. And so Jose Zeledon and his wife you know, sort of emotionally nursed the Ridgeways back to health. Jose Zeledon's wife is named Amparo. And I'm absolutely certain that is what this was, was an homage to to uh, to. Jose Zeledon's wife. And so you can see all the different things you um, can see if you Google Amparo. It's a car spray. It's, um, um, you know, and there's a definition of it, a strong blue to brilliant purplish hue. But the origins of that term have been um, lost until, until I figured it out. <laughs> and so, um, you know, these color names contain many different kinds of shout outs. So uh, blue names originating with Ridgeway. Um, there's Chapman's blue named after Frank Chapman. There's Leitch's blue. Um, Leitch was a painter. There's Vanderpool's blue. Amy Vanderpool was a art was an artist. There's uh, Alice blue. Um, on his, fully 10% of his colors are different shades of blue. So Alice Kellicott was this woman who worked at the Smithsonian, doing creating specimens. King's blue. Clarence King, who I mentioned, was on the uh, one of the surveys where Ridgeway went along as the naturalist. Ridgeway was just 16 when he went on this trip to the American West as the naturalist. You couldn't do that today, but back then he did. J. Blue. By the way, both of my kids have bird middle names. One of them is J, Paxton J. Lewis. And my other kid, um, their middle name is Palila. The Palila is a Hawaiian honey creeper. Um, Loxioides valuae. <laughs> I couldn't call them Loxioides valuae, so I called them um, Palila for their middle name. <laughs> Mont Mont Blue. Uh, Rude's Blue. Ogden Rude was a color theorist. Bradley's blue. So Milton Bradley, the board game magnate, he created board games. Perhaps you're familiar with them. Um, but before he was a board game guy, he was a color guy. He created color wheels for use in grade schools and uh, many other applications for these um, of these of these colors in in classrooms. Other people create derivative works from this. Here's a book called The Lilac by a woman named Sus Susan McKelvey. 
And she says up front, four charts of selected colors conforming to Robert Ridgway's color standards and nomenclature. This is in 1928, so 16 years after he publishes his 1912 color dictionary. And you can see her color chart. She's taken directly his own color um, swatches, his own color identifications. There are other um, exemplars for color that come along. This is a very famous one, Universal Code of Colors. Um, um, and you can see some of these swatches. And you can see the Pantone colors start to emerge out of these systems. They're more regular. They're more in line with the kind of Pantone colors that come along. This one's from the 1940s. Um, and so the Pantone system is really on the verge of being um, created. You can hold the color up and, and uh, put it right on top of something um, to compare the color. So Ridgeway, Ridgeway's book and these other books were used by for many other things besides natural history. So if you had a stamp collection, for instance, the value of many postage stamps relies on, so you can have one stamp that is a particular, uh, say it's a three cent stamp of, I don't know, Simon Bolivar, <laughs> and it um, is a particular shade of green. You can have another stamp that's with that's much more valuable, that, that the only difference is it's a slightly different color. Uh, and the only way to tell it apart is because it's a slightly different color. So people would use Ridgeway's color dictionary and others like this one to actually compare the, to actually try to compare the colors of the stamp. So they use these for not just natural history reasons, but for all sorts of other purposes. And so I've probably seen more copies of, the, of that particular, um, of this particular book. Let me just go back to it for a second here. Uh, of, um, give me a second here as I'm sorting through my slides of, I'm almost there, hold on, of this particular book. Um, I've probably seen more copies of this than anybody in the world. I bet I've seen 150 different copies of this. They're remarkably similar, so they haven't faded. There's a warning at the front of every one that says, warning, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Do not leave these plates exposed to light for any longer than is possible. And so, um, you know, to be able to see many, many different copies of the same book is very revealing because it shows you um, how reliable the colors were and how accurate they were over um, a long period of time. So let me get back to my, uh, my, previous, my previous slide here. So you could hold these over the colors and um, demonstrate the colors and compare the colors. They're also used, so I mean, I, one of the things I've been doing as a, as a curator working in a research library is buying up samples of color that do different things. So this is a, an example of fabric samples and um, people use these dyes for many different kinds of uh, criteria. You've got the, uh, um, you can see the names here in French of the different series, rose, tabac, tobacco, cherry rose, um, by ways of um, identifying dyes. And often these use Ridgeway's colors as well. There are many, uh, many examples of these particular kinds of colors. Um, Federation is a silk federation of silk makers in Lyon and their own version of these colors. And they, they continue on and on and on. And so um, I'll close with this particular thing. One of the things that becomes very important, if you're a manufacturer and you're creating products that use a particular color, you need a recipe for them. You need to know how to make them. And you want people to understand how to recreate these colors. So this is a German uh, dye book. I purchased this for the Huntington some years ago from a dye company, a dye manufacturing company. So it's got a sample of the wool fabric colored with dye and then a swatch of the, uh, a sample of the woven fabric and then a recipe by percentage of the contents of the dye itself to make these particular colors. So people relied heavily on things like this to um, identify. So identifying things with color is one thing, being able to replicate a recipe for dyes is another. None of the recipes for Ridgeway's colors have survived. So it's, a, it's too bad. I've, had, I've spent a lot of time looking to try to find them. He had them printed by a German company named Hohen. I can't find their archives, I've tried. And so we don't know exactly how the colors were made. That information seems to be lost, but I'm ever hopeful that the historical record will produce 
um, you know, new information about these about these things. And here's another look at some of these dye books and um, samples. And finally, um, the Pantone smoothie, which is fun. If you want to make a smoothie, you can uh, make a, a mango cucumber smoothie using Pantone 610U. And that's the color you'll end up with if you put these ingredients into a blender and you mix them up. Ultra fresh summer flavor. Mix and enjoy. <laughs> the one on the right is Pantone smoothie 1895. The zesty raspberry, um, and you can see the ingredients you need precisely to get this color shade. It says make it together, pour over ice, and so it's a way to <laughs> enjoy color. Color is a lot of fun. It shows up in a lot of different kinds of venues, and um, and it's got a wonderful intersection with the with the world of birds. Uh, okay, and that's the that's the end of my talk. Thank you all very much for your attention, and uh, and uh, bring me your questions. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. That was uh, quite a trip through history, through you know the lives of different people with the stories that you told. Uh, the arsenic was quite fascinating, the poisoning. Yeah, that's very interesting about the association with depression. I'm sure that would make a great article. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to kind of talk about that. Um, we do have uh, a question that came in. Okay. From uh, Beth, she's asked, what is the best light that we can get a better and you know view of these colors? If there's an, any kind of instruction uh, through these dictionaries on what kind of lighting should be used That's for that? Good. That's a so, great question. You know, the, the, I think, I mean, I don't know this because it doesn't say it in the book, but I think what they intended these things to be used in the field. And so you'd want to look at them in regular sunlight. They're very matte in their finish. They're not. They're not glossy. They're not reflective. And so, you 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 don't have to worry about um, reflection from sunlight sort of distorting the color. You'd want to look at them in natural sunlight. You could use natural sunlight indoors, you know, through a window or out in the field. But they were made really for field use. It's a relatively small, compact book. It's about. I don't know if you can see my hands. It's about this tall. I I meant to bring one with me on my trip, but I didn't. So I don't have one to wave in front of you on the camera, but it's, um, um, you know, and, and, and I think the dyes that he used are actually relatively light fast, judging by the fact that for all the copies I've seen, they might be abraded or rubbed a little bit for some of these. And it's now a hundred and more than a hundred years old. They've survived well, the colors haven't faded. So I think you could look at them under different kinds of light, um, but probably natural light. That's a long roundabout answer, but probably under natural light. Well, there, there is a, I was thinking as you're speaking, Dan, that because people are seeing these by comparison, so they're comparing the swab, the swatch to uh, the, the patch to an actual object, yeah. both objects are going to be seen under the same lighting. So yeah. even if the lighting has is warm or cool, depending on the day, you're applying that same lighting to both uh, things you're comparing with. So the comparison would yeah. still be valid, right? It would, yeah. You'd want you'd want them to be lit in the same environment. The other thing is you'd want the other if if you're in conversation with somebody about these colors, you would also want them to have a similar, even though they've got the swatch, you want everyone to sort of be on the same visual page, I guess, is the way right. to think about it in terms of viewing the the color and then the item that they're trying to identify. You know. Great, thank you. Yeah. Gustavo, you want to go for the next question? Please. Yeah, yeah. Do do we want do we want to make Daniel Mello uh, question or can I no, make it first please. and then yeah. Daniel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Gustavo. Like, very, very, very interesting. And uh, like you presented us uh, the importance that birds ha uh, have on colors evolution, like uh, the past for, since like the 1980s, uh, the, the 18s. Uh, from now and how the nature can help in so many areas in, in technology. Uh, now let's talk about the future. Uh, okay. How do you see the evolution, uh, 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 like on in mobile applications like Merlin or uh, BirdNet, and that uses the, the artificial intelligence? Uh, yeah. And how do you see like these kind of studies can help the, this kind of future that they seem so far from each other, but they're so connected. 
And how do you see this? This yeah, this this is connected. That's a that's a great question. And this is I haven't really thought about this, but when you ask it, I can think of some things that are useful to understand. And so I could just just speculatively, I could imagine being in a study collection in a museum. So you have a whole spe series of specimens of birds laid out, and you're trying to understand where they are in the in it, where they are evolutionarily. Have they speciated? You know, you have a range of different examples from pale blue to darker blue. You have color morphs among some of these birds. I can imagine an app if the camera was good enough where you could take a photograph, have it read the color sample, apply a Pantone name, or even one of Ridgeway's color names and um, tell you things. So you could do analysis. So next week I have the, the, the guy, a guy named Riss Newman is the head of design for Google Robotics. <laughs> and so he's coming by He's really interested in these color dictionaries. And so we're going to go up to our lab, our, our conservation lab, and we have a color um, densitometer. And so we're going to do some testing with this densitometer to see if we can do exactly this kind of thing. That's what he's interested in, is find a way to quantify color for Google. So yeah. he, we really hit it off well because we met during the pandemic and we Zoomed a few times. And now he's come out to see me once. And he's coming out again. But he's really interested in the technical applications for these color and but you have to be able to measure color accurately and so it might be that a phone camera photograph or software on the phone isn't enough because of the instrumentation you need to read it you need something called a densitometer to read it to read color to get a spectral reading and you know phone cameras still are they're good but they're not that good i don't think and so i think there's still some work to be done with the technology maybe using the camera as an interface between another tool um, so that some, there's something doing the processing and there's some hardware to, and software to make sense of the, the image that you've captured. But uh, all that to say, I think there's some really useful applications that we'll get out of mobile devices that let us quantify color and then use it comparatively. Because in some ways, it's all about comparative uses. It's really what makes these color tools the most valuable. It's the fact you can compare one color to another and, yeah, and quantify sure. it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Miller, do, do you want to make Daniel Mello? Yeah, question? yeah, sure. I can do that. Uh, Daniel Mello had a question like, what happened with the printing industry? And he's kind of complaining, even with all the technological evolution, it's still very hard to get the precise colors on printing, especially on paper. Yeah. I, I, that's a great question. I, I don't, I'm not an authority on modern printing colors as a historian. My, my knowledge stops from 1955. <laughs> but I mean, it's absolutely true that, um, you know, and, and that's a super valid complaint. And you see it all the time. I see it on Facebook and Instagram, people that have, got, have bought a color, a field guide. You know, the colors are off. There's some examples that like, I forget who it was, one of David Sibley's books. You know, some of these field guides, they just get the color wrong. And of course, it's so important for bird identification, right? And so, to get the color wrong, even if it's all shifted light or shifted dark, um, it's maddening. And I, and I think it's, this is a speculation on my part. I think it's really about the fact that volume printing of color is difficult. If you're doing it in small bespoke, small runs, it's easier to control the color. If you're running it through a huge press and you're printing 50 or 60,000 copies, I think it's harder to control the quality, which is why they do press checks and you're supposed to check uh, you know, these things. But again, there's no substitute for the original. But of course, people have to rely on printed works. And there's no, there's no way around that. You know, the printed works have an enormous value, of course, right? And so, um, illustration, I think that's still something we haven't really resolved. Uh, this ties in, uh, you, I want to make a comment, but I'm going to ask Gutu's question. He has a question tie in. I think it, you know, it ties in with what you commented about. Okay using uh, egg wash to create some kind of sheen on, on colors mm -hmm. uh, in the originals, because, you know, I think that's one of the problems of, of printing, of course, that, you know, there's a limitation of what you can show. And I, then Gutu also talks about how did naturalists uh, deal yeah. with uh, iridescent colors, like the hummingbird colors and, yeah. uh, you know, other colors. How, how did they deal with that in yeah. describing them? The, the, yeah, I, I see his question there. They're, 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 they're I mean, one of the, there's there's no perfect translation from a reflective iridescent color that changes based on the angle at which the light is refracting off of the object and so it's sort of a you have to take 
those iridescent colors as a steady state. The same problem occurs for people that are trying to do bird illustrations in the 19th century. So John Gould does his books on hummingbirds, his big, large things with um, iridescent colors. And, and, you know, the monograph of the, tro the Trochilidae, they're all hummingbirds. They're, it's a worldwide survey of hummingbirds, done big, beautiful hummingbirds. And he has the same problem trying to represent it visually in a, in a, in a printed illustration that's hand colored. So he uses, he uses iridescent colors in some ways, but it's a, just a rough approximation. And, and really there's no way, I mean, again, I mean, really one of the takeaways is there's nothing like the original, <laughs> whether it's a bird or it's color or, or it's representation. You know, there's nothing, there, there's no substitute for, for understanding a bird than seeing it in the field. And one of the things that field guides do is that they have descriptive text that then will lay out so many useful things that a color cannot capture. So they'll say, you know, I, 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 ha I don't have a field guide with me, but, you know, you, if you look at some of those color descriptions, they're very clever. They'll say things like, you know, buffy throat is a buffy iridescent sheen when seen in medium light or, or in dappled shade. And so you can describe different circumstances where colors change on a bird in a textual way that's very hard to do with just a flattened color sample. So there are limitations to these color samples. Guto, I don't know if that is a useful answer, but that's, um, you know, that I think that's the truth of the matter is that then you have to rely on other things like text um, or motion picture footage in some cases to really capture colors that change like that. Okay. Uh, Gustavo, any comments? Uh, I have some, but if you... Okay, I'm going to continue. I, I was I was very interested because um, I'm also, you know, the, the, you, as you, as you know, of course, and as you were requested by the Huntington Library of, you know, let's digitize all our books and how much would how long would that take. <laughs> I, uh, I think I find that fascinating because you know we see these uh, this idea that you know all our collections need to be online so everybody can see them and give access et cetera. And I, I'm a, a believer of that in many ways for a lot of the collections sure. we have. I think it's important, but uh, it's quite interesting. You're, you're you're right about the fact of you know seeing the original and having people come and do research and access the original documents is uh, quite yep. interesting. And of course, you know, it's, it's very obvious that in 140 years, uh, you know, you probably would be changing technology so many times during that digitization process. <laughs> they, it would, they, would, they wouldn't even talk within each other, right? So that's, that's right, that's right. Different, right. different ways, yeah. Yeah, so, and those are just printed items. So manuscript items are much slower because you can't use an automatic page turning machine for those. Someone has to manually turn the page. You have to unfold pages. So Google Books never photographs folded pages. They don't have time. So if, if a book has a, a plate that's folded, they, they don't usually stop and unfold. They just churn along. And so a lot sure. of stuff gets mixed. I have many examples of, I have many examples of um, why digitizing things doesn't work very well. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they're not all bird examples, but but I got a call from the a curator at Monticello, which is Thomas Jefferson's home in Virginia, was his home, and Thomas Jefferson did all the drawings for the University of Virginia, the architectural plans, and this person called me and they said, I've got a I've got a a drawing, and it looks like there's a wall where there's supposed to be a door, and can you go look at the original? We have the original drawing. Can you go look at the drawing and see if you can see anything about that so okay so i went down to a vault and i found the drawing and i printed out the printout and i had the original in my hand i looked at them both they looked the same and i thought huh and i held the original up to the light and what jefferson had done is he had erased he had erased the wall making a little thin in the paper and then he changed his mind and he'd drawn the wall back in place but what was left was this little thin in the paper this thin mark and the only way you could see it was to hold it up and have light pass through it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to see it, which is why it wasn't visible to the curator in Virginia that was looking at it. So there are many examples of why That's great. the original is superior to the, <laughs> to the digital. And of course, we all need digital tools, right? We need them. We use them for many different things. I would be lost without my Merlin app, for instance, and the fact that I can listen for sounds you know, and do IDs. And I, you know, I would be, it's, it's so, it makes me such a better birder 
I've got to say to have those kinds of tools, but there are just some cases where you need to see the, um, the originals. And so you use them both, you use the digital tools and you use the, the originals and they work in concert with each other. I think is the way yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I want to, to tie with this uh, comment because uh, we have, we have like in, in Navistar, we have like uh, bird watchers that are starting uh, that like mm. have 20 or 30 years uh, of uh, on field, and how do you see that uh, this evolution uh, and technology, this technology, uh, the, the applications and technology uh, applied on, on bird watching, uh, they make the, the hobby more democratic, you know, more access, accessible, uh, because uh, it it feels I, I'm I'm a bird watcher like for two and a half years, and I mm -hmm. I started with the technology. I feel that it was so uh, tough to get the information and to, of course, the books were there and the, the, they were accessible, but uh, it was not as easy as you were commenting. Like, it's so easy yeah. to uh, take the picture, identify and listen to something and put on BirdNet and identify. So how do you see this evolution make the, made the hobby more democratic and, and so accessible? That's a great question, Gustav. I've thought a lot about that. So, for instance, you know, I, I use, I've started using Merlin's um, Listen for the Bird app. And so you often will see a bird, you'll hear a bird before you see it. And often you'll only hear it. You'll never see it sometimes in some circumstances. And, you know, it makes me a better birder because it, it helps me once I, I don't just stop once I hear it, then I go looking for it. And, but to know what it is, is a piece of evidence before I've even seen the bird. And, you know, th th these tools aren't always accurate. They're about 85% accurate, I'm told. Um, the, the things like Merlin's sound thing. But I turned on my, I was somewhere, where was I? I was in Boston last month. And I was walking around and I turned on the sound, you know, f f whatever it's called, find a bird or listen for a bird or something. I turned it on and I looked at it for a second and something happened. I put it in my pocket, but I never turned it off. So I walked for 20 minutes. <laughs> I pulled up my phone and it had kept recording. And it listed all the birds that it had heard. And so I thought, ha. Huh. So then I went back and I went looking for those birds. I thought, well, these are, seem to be in the same way that if you had a field guide, you'd, you would say, or, or one of those checklist, regional checklists that say, oh, these are the following birds that are found here at this time of year. You know, um, it, in a way, it was like one of those checklists. I had a list that had been ground truth. I don't know if that, you know, that term, the, you had, you had got, evidence that it was there so then you could go look for it and i found that really satisfying because i still wanted to find the bird and see it but it helped me work out the identification before seeing the bird in some ways so um i just found that super useful yeah mainly for to... for the, mainly for those that, that are starting that can uh, yeah. hear a lot and can't identify and can go after the the bird they are yeah they are, yeah, uh, they, yeah they, they, there's no they, they're really useful tools i've just i've decided because you know a lot of people say well you know you make it so easy well it's never easy <laughs> it really isn't it, it, in in it, in in a lot of ways it's about what people want out of their bird watching experience do they want to see the bird in action? Well, yes, I, I imagine most people do. Is it just simply that they want to identify it? Well, in some cases, yes. There are people that are just, they're just, um, what's the word we use? They, they're just uh, listers. You know, they just want to tick off a bird. So there's something for everybody <laughs> with a lot of these, I, I think, with a lot of these digital tools. I just find them fascinating. And I'm fascinated by the ways that people use them too, <laughs> you know. Nice. Uh, Daniel, we still have some questions. Uh, Eduardo Franco is asking if the colors can be used as bioindicators. So a landscape that's more colorful could possibly be a more ecologically healthy landscape. It's a question. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. You know, um, I suppose so. <laughs> I, I suppose if, if I understand that correctly, I think you could... You'd want to have some sort of computer intervention <laughs> to do something like that, right? You'd want to be able to pass these colors. If you know, to, to, as bioindicators, you'd have to have. I'm just thinking about this. You'd have to have a fairly sophisticated way to test a color against um, against a background environment, right? Uh, so I think you'd have to have. If if I understand the question properly, Gilson, I think you'd have to have a way to pass it through. Um, some sort of computer program that could take a color, 
compare it to a, you know, you'd have a set of colors that you knew indicated particular things, you know, new foliage or a particular kind of what, I don't know, a particular color of wood on a tree or, or the color yeah, or, or, the, or the, the, the moss or something. The moss, right. Or the way yeah. that uh, the hillside might look after the rain. So here, so in Southern California, everything's brown all the time, but we have had a lot of rain lately. So now the, the hillsides are green, you know, and so you, you could take indicators like that and make sense of the, um, of as bio, it's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that as bioindicators, you know, as, as um, tools to understand the health of an environmental, of an, of an ecosystem, perhaps. Yeah, Guto is saying, but in the polls, everything is white. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, well, so it wouldn't work very well. Wouldn't work very well there. <laughs> All right. We have a, another question by Richard uh, Jose Bolivar asking okay. if there are uh, archaeological studies of color in the world of pre-Columbian cultures. And he mentions that the, the Paracas culture use the the bird feathers in the confection of you know uh, uh garments that uh -huh. have been perfectly preserved he's just giving that as an example yeah i i the short answer is i don't know <laughs> i mean that's an interesting possibility because you can imagine that people in pre-literate prehistoric cultures would have had have had probably had the same fundamental needs that we have now in distinguishing colors for a lot of different reasons. If you're using a particular feather or a particular organic compound or some composition for something, for a cultural reason, for decorative reasons, for sacred reasons, for reasons, you know, you know, ceremonial reasons, you want to be sure you have the right thing, right? You want to have the right object. And the way you know if you have the right object, perhaps, is to know that it's the right color. So you wouldn't want to send someone off into the forest to get a particular paste for something that was the wrong thing. You'd want to know what color it was. And so I don't, I mean, I don't know. And maybe you, they'd say here's, maybe they had other ways. I, they, I'm speculating. They might say, well, here's a feather. <laughs> it's a particular kind of red. Go find some mud that's about this red color. That's how you'll know it's the right color. You'd have to have some, again, a, a comparative tool, I think. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we're almost running out of time. I did have one uh, question that was, you know, when we talk about dictionaries yeah. and we talk about language, you know, we've seen things in German and French, English mainly. Uh, and when we talk about making this universal, uh, what's been the experience of these dictionaries and having, because we, like we know that, uh, you know, the Pantone uses a numbering system. And when we have like a natural language, like the terms in English, how would they translate to other languages? Or would people be, yeah. have been, are people re pretty much required to use the original uh, German or French or English version, you know, to compare? Yeah, that's a, Millard, that's a great question. I mean, one of the, that's a difficulty with them. One of the solutions people have uh, come up with, and they've had this idea for a long time. And I, I had a slide up that showed one of the, swatches in Ridgway's book also uses at the very top above the swatches it uses the solar spectra and so it's got a particular formula that dictates what part of the solar spectra the visible solar spectra the color is so in a way that is a universal indicator and in fact when Ridgway wrote these books he was urged by the head of the Smithsonian who was a physicist to really rely on that number that formula instead of a user name for that exact reasons, you know, that you, then you wouldn't have any language difficulties because the solar spectra is universal. And the way that astronomers and physicists think about color can be quantified in a way that um, you can de delineate in a book. But from practical, imagine if, if I wrote you and said, Millard, I, I'd like to talk to you about a particular color. It's three slash 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 three, four G four, nine, one. It gets more, and, and you know, these formula are complicated. And so it gets more complicated, not just conversationally, but in, more generally in the ways that people communicate about color. So it's a problem. I mean, they, they, I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, arrogant English speakers tend to think their language is the only language. <laughs> and so, and, and, and of course, English has become an official language in a lot of ways for a lot of places. You know, I'm giving this talk in English. 
Sure. But, um, you know, so I think people, I think it's somewhat something of a default assumption that people would need to use English to do it. But if you look at, you think about how, I mean, if you open up, so I, I went to look at my field guide to the birds of Brazil last week. And I, and I noticed at the back, there's a whole delineation of all the Portuguese names for the birds of Brazil. So even if you're an English speaker, you still have access to and still know what the, what the bird names are, the common names are. Of course, the scientific mm -hmm. names are the scientific names. But, um, you know, so, for, so in terms of understanding the um, color, it becomes more difficult. You, you, you know, Ridgway never offered up foreign language versions of these names. It wouldn't be hard because they're not so idiosyncratic or so idiomatic that you couldn't um, sure. work out a translation. So no one's tried yeah. to do that that I've ever been aware yeah. of. But. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we have one last question before we, our time's pretty much up. And it's one from Guto again. He said that the uh, birds have a color vision that's similar to humans. Mm -hmm. And how does this influence the, ga the um, gamma of colors that we use? Well, hmm. I mean, I think they're different things. I mean, birds can see outside the spec. They are similar, but they can see, depending on the species, they can see um, into the ultraviolet range um, in a way we can't mostly. That's that's the one. I mean, they can push further into the higher spectra visually than we can. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we don't ask the birds themselves to do any identification work. So I'm not sure that it really, um, that it really applies. But, you know, it, it's, you know, I mean, there's a whole lot to be done. So I guess what I guess what I would say to that is, it'd be great to figure out a way to map birds' understanding of color onto our understanding of color in some kind of visual, you know, comparative way. I don't know what it would look like because you know to get into the, I don't know. You, we could work up some interesting experiments. You know, ornithologists are endlessly clever, and so there are probably uh -huh. some experiments out there still waiting to be done about. You know just what birds can see and what what things look like outside of our visual um capacities you know because they they have different capacities it depends very much on the species so as i understand so it. species will go into the ultraviolet but not into the infrared and not, not so over. not so not so, as i understand as i recall not so much okay you know, maybe a few i can't recall which ones but yeah so is it efficient to, to use the camouflage to bird watch <laughs> The camouflage, the, 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 camouflage. The camouflage. Yeah, the camouflage. Like, or are we just buying clothes? Like, <laughs> for not. For it's not. just, it's just a commercial thing. <laughs> with the, yeah, the, cam the cam, the camouflage. Yeah, I don't, I don't get. But no bright colors. That's the, that's one of the rules of thumb yeah, for learning. Yeah, uh, no, no bright uh, colors. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we are uh, already past our time. And uh, Daniel, thanks very, very much. It was a fascinating lecture. Thanks, and Mueller. Mine's we really uh, appreciate, uh, you know, we want to see more. You know, we, uh, uh, you're, you're planning a new exhibition at some point. Is that correct? Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be 2026 or seven by the time that we uh, do it, because it'll be in a new building. But there'll be something bird, birdie. I was just at the New York Historical Society in New York here because they have all of Audubon's original artwork for the Birds of America. And um, my next book's about parrots. It's called America, American Parrot is what it's going to be called, about what it means to say something is American and what it means. Anyway, so I've, I've got a new book in the works about, about parrots. <laughs> so the parrots book. in America, right? Yeah, but, but the, it's an open question about what constitutes America, like what right. America we mean north and south the, america the, the americas right the the, the, the americas yeah so yeah. stay stay tuned okay, okay. that nice. sounds like great okay we will yeah. all right well thanks Good. again gustavo thank yeah. you for participating. thank you thank you Milar. thank you uh, thank you to thank all you, our, our everybody from the organization we thank them too for the, they're in the background here doing all the work and thank you for the public that showed up tonight we had a pretty very good decent public uh coming in on our channels so i think that was great Lard, if you want i'll put my email in the chat i don't know if the chat i'm in is the public chat but if anyone has any questions i'm glad to field them uh let's um, see i'm not sure how we can i can i'll i'll say it out loud it's uh, because I, it's d lewis at huntington.org h-u-n-t-i-n-g-t-o-n.org so D. Lewis. Thanks, yeah. Dan.
Yes, thank you, Millard. Okay, it was a pleasure meeting both of you, and uh, maybe we'll meet up sometime later in, in our in the so. bird world. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Or color nice world. Nice to meet you. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.